Hawa. You want peace. You want power. You want both. Yeah, I hope y'all ain't in a rush, man. I'm, I'm coming. I'm coming. I'm just uh, getting cozy. Hawa. What y'all want to dig on today, man? What y'all want to dig on today? Yo, man, love to uh, the fan band. Love to Brother Jay in the UK, man. Been digging on them picks, man. He uh, sent me an email with some great pick drop. We getting there, my family, my family, my bro. And this was the book, man. I was looking for the PDF, and I found a source out in the uh, in London. I had to get this order from London, man. So it came. It's called the Cruthin, the history of the Ulster, the Ulster landing people, huh? What does it mean? By uh, Ian Adamson, man. So love to you, bro. I got the drop, man. I'm reading it, man. So you know, I'm kicking back. Yeah. The picks, the picks, the picks, the Pictish throne, the Pictish kings. How does it play? How does it play? We will be dropping on this, so uh, I told y'all to drop, don't stop. All praise our creator for providing the water, providing the breath, the goat. I definitely want to get back into the American Holocaust today, so let's put that down. And man, how about we dig on a little bit of this too, man. Been meaning to get back into Africans and Native Americans, the language of race and the evolution of red, ruddy, black, so-called black people, all right? But this got some drop in it, in it, by uh, my man uh, Forbes, man. Jack Forbes, Jack D. Forbes, all right? And these are, you know, they label them Inca, all right? I love to AD, who was talking about that Inca. He was like, man, how does the Inca play? I mean, are the Inca hijacks? It seems like a hijack happened with this Inca, man. I mean, were they didn't call themselves Inca, so were they originally hijacked? If they were a hijack, one, are are the Incas a hijack? Based on your recon, you know what I'm saying? What side were they on? Were they doing any treaties, or did they just go down in the blaze? Or were they a hijack that eventually went down also? Or were they pure water and got hijacked? I mean, how did the cons play? How does Genghis Khan play when he rode up on Prester John? And are we looking at a literal Khan on Khan? More, 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 more Khan Khan. Right? Khan is priest. Khan is a law giver. Law giver, a title. So Khan is a title. Priest, king, priest, Khan. They all want the Khan. Priest, king, Prester John, Wang Khan. When Genghis Khan rode up on his uncle, uh -huh. Or foster uncle or foster son, whatever it is, you know what I'm saying? Anyway, man, we're going to get digging. We're going to get to digging on it, man. So let's go, man. Let's go. Hope you're having a good day. Hope you ain't in no rush, man. Left the Paco. Just had a great power obsession. I needed it. Thank you, my brother. Let go. Oh, uh, wow. Whenever you, you know, stuck in a rut, whenever you need to, you know, get above something, remember you're the seeds of Hawakab, Hawakwa. You're the seeds of Jacob, man. So, by definition, you're in the name of that which can overcome any boundary. All right. So, if you don't get nothing else, if you came here just to check whatever out, I don't care who you are. I don't care where you're from. I don't care if you're a hijack. I don't care, man, if you COINTEL Pro just sitting at your desk opening up a King Drop folder like this. I don't care if you a hijack that dislikes every one of these videos, but you like, man, let me find something. I love you. It's all good. It's all good because it got to be all good. It's all good because it was created all good. And I'm just in the frequency, you know, I'm choosing to be in the frequency of all good. All right. So I love y'all. It's all good. Inglewood, stand up. <laughs> Cali, stand up. Hometown, home turf, home city. That's just who I am. Let go.
Hey man, I want to jump into it, man. I'm gonna go. Let's just do it. Let's just do it. American Holocaust, David Stanner. I'm jumping into page 42. We do got a PDF of this up in the library, y'all. So dig on it. Let's go. Compared with Meso Mesoamerican cities, those of the Incas were Incas were almost austere. They were brilliant. So these cities of the Inca, you know, were considered more brilliant than others in the Mesoamerican cities. Even the fabulous city of Cusco. We done dug on the Cusco city of David. Uh, we done dug on Cusco city of David. At first seemed more brilliant in its superb surface simplicity. Its streets laid out on the cruciform, cruciform plain. Its houses, most single-story affairs, were steeply pitched roofs to fend off the heavy rains of the Andes. A wide, breathe, breath, security, foundation. We have a foundation and a secure breath. Nature, natural by law. <laughs> nature is law. Law is nature. Law is vibration. Creation, vibration. Apart from its gold, the first Europeans were most impressed with Cusco's exceptional cleanliness. Again, I just went to another chapter last time. Get the get the previous drop on this. We did a couple drops on this already. We're continuing because it just makes sense to. And you keep getting about the cleanliness, man. Negro. Not savageness, cleanliness, purity, Aztec, people of whiteness, purity, in your frequency, how do you say whiteness, go. Right. That's the frequency they were in, it's a frequency, it wasn't whiteness, it was the purity, it was the cleanliness, it was the righteousness. Apart from its gold, the first Europeans were most impressed with Cusco's exceptional cleanliness. Perhaps exemplified by the clear water rivers and streams, the mountains, from the mountains, from the trees that flow through the center of the Inca capital. Before entering the city, these waters, upstream pools and rivulets provided Bathing and recreation for Cusco's inhabitants for years after the Spanish conquest, wrote one conquistador, it was common to find their small gold ornaments or pins which Inca women forgot or dropped while bathing <laughs> or they stole while massacring these people. As the rivers ran through Cusco, however, they were captured and diverted into perfectly engineered stone gutters that followed the roots of the city's main streets, helping to wash away debris and keep the roadways clean. At the center of Cusco was an enormous plaza large enough to accommodate 100,000 people, wrote the Spanish friar Martin de Mur Mur Murua, Morua, Murua, most of these Mures or Moors or Mures. And they're going to make a differentiation about the Mauritania and the Morocco. The, uh, you know, Northern Africa connection with this indigenous America connection. And what it really is. When the pleasure loving people of this metropolis held their frequent dances and festivals in the square. It was roped off from the fine cable of gold. It was roped off with a fine cable of gold. <laughs> Immensely long, so a long cable of gold, man. And fringed at both ends with bright red wool. So this gold had fringes. Around the cer ceremonial square stood Cusco's palaces, each built by an Inca ruler during his reign. Here lay the dead leader's mummified remains. Mummified, huh? Along with all their, uh, all their furniture and treasures. There were no locks or keys or nothing in the palaces was hidden. As John Hemming 
puts it, the Incas were too confident of the security of the empire and the honesty of its citizens to hide their dead rulers' possessions. Woo! So what these invaders, and we're going to get to this Black Plague in Europe and the pestilence, you have to know the mentality of a hijack when they're finding you. You have to know what was their reality and that finding you only gave them a, a checkpoint of life. They absorbed your life for a season. But all that absorbing is done that they can't get any more life from you. Because you're choosing up. You're choosing to give your life to the creator. You see, when you don't, you give it to them. They rule you for a time. Take it all. Because everything you have is in a breath. <laughs> Everything you have is in a covenant. Everything you have is in a vibration. When you violate that vibration, you violate your covenant with everything. You violate your covenant with the animals. You violate your covenant with the land, so you have no land. And you're a people walking around today. You might have a Mercedes Benz, but where's your land, Negro? I'm not just talking about, you know, even if you do own your own piece of land. I'm talking about where's the land of the people? What are we talking about here? The, the people, not you, Negro, the people. And if you as a people, because there is no separation between you and the people, if you as a people don't have land, you are cursed. You are in a sad state of disregard. You are in a sad state of disregard. Come up out of her because you were not created to be in that fallen state. Where you go to the grocery store and you say, hmm, let me buy some mystery meat. Somebody said, it's okay. That means you're asleep, Negro. Your ancestors would slap the back of your head and say, it's not okay unless we know it's okay. Unless it comes from us, it's okay. Let's go. So these Inca, you know what I mean, they just lay the possessions. Imagine to these people, it must have been millions and millions and millions of dollars, but they just say, nah, man, ain't nobody touching this. It's secure because... They were of that vibration. They were in a... These people came and found you in a whole nother frequency. But you had such a high frequency and resonance that even in a hijack state, you still had frequency over these people that found you. They're still trying to figure out your frequency. You're still trying to reverse engineer your frequency. You are the greatest technology. Look in the mirror. Here lay the dead leader's mummified remains. All right. Now they were mummified remains, which reminds you, of course, of Egypt. So, all right. Think about the original question. Are the Incas a hijack? Is there some drop to this mummified thing? I'm just throwing that in there. <laughs> or uh, did they get hijacked, you know what I'm saying, by the same Egypt vibration? which we know that these Moors had with permission of the Pharaoh. They were always rocking with permission of the Pharaoh, so they never rocked separate from the Pharaoh that had you in captivity, which is why they signed treaties for your captivity. It's really simple. <laughs> no one wants you to rise, Negro. Not for real, for real. Here lay the dead leaders' mummified remains along with their furniture and treasures. There were no locks or keys and nothing in the place was hidden. As John Hemings put it, the Incas were too confident of the security of the empire and the honesty of its citizens to hide their dead ruler's possessions. All the Inca palaces were different, made of various types of marble, rare woods, and precious metal, but each had at least one common characteristic. Enormous halls and ballrooms capable of holding up to 4,000 people for banquets and dancing. When the weather prevented such festivals, fe festivities from being held outdoors. One such hall, which served on rainy days as a plaza for Inca festivals or dances, was so large, wrote Gasselasso de la Vega, that 60 horsemen could very easily play canas or canas inside it. It's like it's some horse game. Kind of, it's probably like polo. It's probably like polo. C-A, where is it at? C-A-N-A-S, all right. More exquisite even than the palaces, however, was the famed Temple of the Sun. Now, are the Incas a hijack? Did they get hijacked by the same sun, Egypt, 
mummified body, or is it one and the same thing? Throwing out the questions. I mean, they can call it. We know we can be reading. You know, obviously we're reading hijack interpretation. So, you know, you know, we're getting the babies out. You know, we're getting the babies out. So they can be calling something sun, sun this temple of sun, in their translations, and maybe it was just, you know, a place of resonating with the energy that Hawa has given us to resonate with. We were created with the frequency of the sun. It is our sun, but we don't worship it. We worship the creator of it. Very simple. But so, you know, I'm surfing away. I don't know. You know, I don't know if this was a sun thing. Maybe they're just writing that it's a sun thing. Let's keep reading. All the Inca palaces were different, made of various marble, rare woods, precious metal, but each had at least one characteristic, enormous halls and ballrooms capable of holding 4,000 people. All right. A magnificent... Right, let's go back. All right. So they talk about the Temple of the Sun. They call it Coracancha. Coracancha. A magnificent masonry structure with precisely curved and angled walls. Coracancha's majesty was crowned with an eight-inch wide band of solid gold that encircled the entire building below the roof line, along with the other treasure that it held at the temple center was a ceremonial font, font and a massive altar of gold surrounded by gold surrounded by gold and silver images of the moon and stars of thunder and great Poncayo, Poncayo. A massive golden sun. All right. Are the Incas hijacked? Did they get hijacked? What happened? Of all this, though it was the garden within its walls that most amazed the chroniclers who wrote about Coracancha, a simple garden of maize, corn, maize, but an artificial garden with the stem and leaves of each perfect plant delicious delicately fashioned in silver while each crowning ear of corn was carved in gold. Cusco's population in pre-Columbian times probably was somewhere between 150,000 to 200,000 people. They don't know. Let's just get that shit out the way. Beyond the city itself, more, many more people living and working on vast maize plantations filled the surrounding valleys, although some Mesoamerican cities such as Tinac Titlan Enoch land, Tinoch, Enoch land, were larger. Few cities in Europe at the time even approached the size of Cusco. We're talking about something on another level. They can downplay it, say it ain't connected to you, say you come from Africa, but in reality, they found high tech people with high tech things. Regardless of the hijack, regardless of whatever, it was on another frequency. And, uh, but it wasn't, you know, these weren't the things we were supposed to worship. These weren't the things that we were supposed to be digging on. You know what I'm saying? We got all into a lot of the fallen angel Atlantis that was already here. So what is it? Again, they didn't call themselves Inca. So no European city even approached the size of Cusco. Nor would any of them have been able to compete with Cusco in terms of the treasures it contained. They found treasures here that they haven't found anywhere. Again, like the AD who said, man, look, man, if they didn't have the sun, if they're begging Estevanico to bring the sun out in Europe, in the cities of gold, they're bringing, they're begging Estevanico the more, the more to bring out the sun, the child of the sun, they need the sun. That means that they didn't have gold there. They don't have treasures there. That means that they came here from Europe, from Africa, from Asia. And never found nothing like what they found here in Mexico, in South America, and then throughout the seven cities of Cibola, Shimbala, Cibola, Udall, the Four Corners, Montezuma's Gold, Mansa Musa's Gold, because Timbuktu, Timbuktu, reality simulation, right here, let's go. So look, man, nor would the, any of them have been able to compete with the with Cusco in terms of the treasures it contained or the care with which it was laid out. For we now know that Cusco was built following a detailed clay model master plan 
and that as can be seen from the air the outline of its perimeter was designed to form the shape of a puma with the famed temple forces of Sasakhuaman, Sak Sak Huaman or Sak Sak Hawa Man Hawa Sak Sak Hawa Man. Remember the H U A is Hawa. Pause it. Read it. Get that drop, man, cause we digging on the paleo. Hire and take the wheel, man. Go. So Sa Sa Hawa Ma at at its head. For the Cusco was unique within Peru for the lavishness of it, of its appointments. It was far from alone in the large number of its inhabitants, other cities and other Andean locales were also huge. Some are famous today, others are not. Among these latter group was the provincial city of what they're calling Jawu Jawu Ja, which you know that J is a hijack, so it also looks like a Awa or Awawa. The, the hijack. So this J U A or Awa or Awa. Or Hawa Hawa. Here is a short description of it by Miguel de Estet. So here's a short description of the provincial city Hawawa or Hawawa or Hawa Hawa. But you know it ain't no Jawu Ja. Alright? And no Ya Ya. So let's go. Here is a short description of it by Miguel de Estete of the earliest Spaniards to see eyes on this Hawa Hawa. So they said this town of Hawawa is very large and lies in a beautiful valley. A great river passes near it and its climate is most temperate. The land is fertile. Hawawa built in the Spanish manner with regular trees, regular streets. So they said it's built in what they're calling the Spanish matter because it had regular streets. So they're coming here seeing it and said, oh, that's built like our stuff. Is it because you had Israelites in Spain? I mean, surely you didn't build those masonry streets in Spain. I mean, oh, the Moors. Were, were there Hebrews in Spain? So it's not Spanish style. It might be more of a Hebrew style street. More of a street that was regular, you know what I'm saying? Connected, connected, connected. So with regular streets and its several subject villages within inside of it. The population of the town and the surrounding countryside was so great that the Spaniards reckoning a hundred thousand people collected at the main square every day. They had a main square like Times Square, right? But a hundred thousand people every day. The markets and streets were so full that every single person seemed to be there. It was the place to be. A hundred thousand people gathered in the marketplace of a single provincial city each day. Many historians intu intuitively have supposed this to be an exaggeration, but after conducting the most detailed and exhaustive Peru's population histories to date, Noble David Cook, so we've got to research this, Noble David Cook had concluded that the number does not appear ex extravagant. To feed a population as enormous as this and a population spread out over such a vast area, the Inca cut miles upon miles of intricate and precisely aligned canals, canals and irrigated agricultural terraces from the steep Andean hillsides in their mountain home and to move these foodstuffs and other supplies from one area to another they conducted more than 25,000 miles of wide highways and connected roads. Both engineered feats astonished the Spaniards when they first beheld them, and for good reason, modern ar archaeologists and hydrolis hydrologists are just as amazed, having discovered the most that most of these grand public work projects were planned, engineered, and constructed to within a degree or two of slope and angle that computer analysis of the terrain now regard as perfect. 
at the time of European contact, European contact, American, the copper color race found here now applied to the descendants, now applied to the descendants of the European. So when we first made this European contact and we're about to get into the pestilence and disease that they came with, European contact and thickly populated Andean valleys were crisscrossed with irrigated canals in such abundance, wrote one conquistador, that it was difficult even upon seeing to believe they were found both in the upland and low-lying regions of the sides of the hills and the foothills descending to the valleys. And these were connected to others running in different directions. All this makes it a pleasure to Across these valleys, he added, because it is as though one were walking amidst gardens and cool groves. I mean, geez, you've been to the grove or some type of little marketplace grove. We got a grove out here, and, and it's all constructed in these ways. And you're like, you know, what's the engineering coming from? A lot of this is engineered the way they found you, Negro, here, copper color race found here, 1828 definition of America. So this is all describing the copper color race found here by the European and now you're making European contact. <laughs> the great highway and other roads dip through steep coastal valleys hugged with the edges of precipitous cliff, precipitous cliffs tunneled through rock and climb in stepladder fashion up sheer stone walls, encountering rivers and lakes in the paths of the roadway. The people of the Andes built large ferries or hard or had engineer had engineers design floating pon, pontoon bridges, floating bridges. I don't even know what that is. What's a floating bridge? Stretching thick interwind cables across the water over distances the length of a modern football field. <laughs> Secured on each side to underground foundations, workmen layered huge bundles of reeds with still more taut cables on top of the original bridge platforms thus creating secure floating highways floating highways floating bridges let's go <clears throat> even after the spanish conquest these bridges remained in use carrying men and horses and supplies as did the hundreds of suspended bridges that the Incas had strung across gorges and high mountain passes throughout the Andes. Such magnificent roads could be nowhere in Christendom in a country as rough as this. Such magnificent roads could be seen nowhere in Christendom in a country as rough as this. So you have the rough terrain, but smooth, beautiful floating roads and floating bridges. And you did this so-called Negro. You're not just some people in some hood claiming some set. You're builders. You're educators. You're your teachers. You're scholars. You know what I'm saying? You're your engineers by craft. By this is who you are. Everywhere you went, we went together with all all of what we need was contained. Even when when we get back to the picks. They say the same thing about the pigs, that these people, you know what I'm saying, these warriors, went wherever they went, you know what I'm saying, they were able to build everything around them because they contained it all. They contained the formula, man, to create their society and, and, and rock, you know what I'm saying, no matter what the situation, no matter what the terrain is. Such magnificent roads could be seen nowhere in Christendom and country as rough as this, wrote Hernando Pizarro. We got on that Pizarro, the cities of gold, that asshole man, Pizarro. He was the worst of the heathen, the worst of the heathen. A judgment echoed by modern scholars and engineers who had an opportunity to study them. Inca roads and bridges were not built for horse traffic, however, but for men and women on foot sometimes accompanied by trains or llamas. Thus the ambivalent reactions of many conquistadors ranging from admiration for Inca ingenuity to terror in the face of their environment. For some were 
Some were in amazement. Some were scared to death. For good reason. When they had no travel, these roads and their con and their quest for riches and power after crossing a river wrote one Spaniard. We had to climb another stupendous mountainside. So this is what they're writing. We had to climb another stupendous mountainside. Looking up at it from below, it seemed impossible for birds to scale it by flying through the air, let alone men on horseback climbing by land. But the road was made less exhausting by climbing in zigzags rather than a straight line. Genius. Zigzags. That's how they got up the mountain, zigzags, not the straight line. That's the drop. Most of it consisted of large stone steps that great, greatly weared the horses and wore down and hurt their hooves, even though they were being led by their bridles. Under such exhausting conditions, the Spaniards and other latter-day int intruders no doubt appreciated the more appreciated the more than 1,000 large lodging houses and hostels and storage storehouses some of them multi-story, multi-story. So you build all this and they use it against you. We're going to get to that. You know what I'm saying? They use your stuff because you stored up so much food. You had such an abundance that it fed them while they conquered you. And that was the irony of it all is that you had it all. <laughs> and the most I allowed all of what you had, just like you said, man, you'll, 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 you'll plant the grapes, but you're not going to be able to enjoy the vineyard. You're not going to be able to enjoy your own land. You're not going to be able to enjoy the toils of your own hand. It will be used against you. Now we're reading about these temples of sons, right? And we're saying, where's this hijack? Was it originally here? You know Atlantis was here? Did this come with this Genghis Khan thing with Preston John? What are they talking about with the Incas? What's the hijack? We know we're tribal. You know, America, you don't get more tribal than this this land. When people wake up to the covenant of this land, it don't get more tribal than this land. I mean, it's already a dominant thing. You're surrounded by it. You're surrounded by the energy of the mother and the father here. All you got to do, Negro, is choose up. But the energy is already around you, man. It's already got them surrounded. The truth got them surrounded already. So under such exhausting conditions, the Spanish and other lat later day intruders no doubt appreciated the more than 1,000 large lodging horses and hostels and storehouses, some of them multi-story, some built into hillside terraces that have been provided for travelers along the Inca roadways. Kind of reminds me of the Silk Roads, the Genghis Khan Silk Roads, like most Inca buildings. These generally were constructed by masons or those that were doing this complex building, working with large, finely, finely worked stones, carefully honed and fashioned to such a degree of smoothness that even when not secured by mortar, the thinnest blade cannot pass between them. Don't you see that today? And these structures like Puma Punku and how they're built, you know what I mean? And these patterns are not just like, you know, they're built, you know, to withstand because they're in such a unique pattern and you're like how did they get you know how, how come I can't how do these stones really fit together in this like look like a jigsaw puzzle of massive stone multi-story built into hillside terraces so they couldn't get an even blade through them in all Spain all right so this here's a quote from Cesar de Leon de Leon this is another quote from them about you in all of Spain, I have seen nothing that can compare with these walls and the laying of their stone. Wrote Cieza de Leon. They were so extraordinary, added Banabe Cobo, that it would be difficult for anyone who has not actually seen them to appreciate their excellence. So, so massive and stable were the Inca walls built in this way that many of them remained in place as the foundations for buildings throughout modern day Peru. Yaru, Haru, Hawa, Haru, Haru. In Cusco, after the conquest, the Spanish symbolically built their churches of Santo Domenico 
atop the walls of the ruin Kora and Kancha. So they came and they built on your frequency. They built their wall, you know, they, they, they built their churches symbolically, specifically in Santo Domingo, atop the walls of the ruin Kora and Kancha on your frequency and your buildings that were already up. And for centuries since, while earthquakes repeatedly have destroyed the churches, the supporting walls of the great temple of the sun had never budged. Although, as we shall see, the early Europeans appreciated the people of the Andes a good deal less than they did those people engineering, those people's engineering accomplishments. So they appreciated your accomplishments, but not you. What does that sound like? Today, they appreciate your accomplishments. You know, when, when it's laid out, they'll say, man, I can appreciate that, but I don't appreciate you because I want to be you. I want, I want that accomplishment for myself. I want to wipe you from the face of history in order to claim that I, accomplishment. I want to wipe out all of your, you know what I'm saying, uh, you know, paintings and, and, and all of your artifacts. I want to iconoclast. I want to whitewash it all so that we can claim the glory of all these kingdoms and dynasties hijack or not we just need glory we just want to claim glory and we can claim it and, and by emulating you know how people say that when people emulate you or whatever that's like the greatest uh compliment or whatever you want to call it you know what i'm saying anybody in this frequency we're all emulating a wow we're all emulating our creator so it's the greatest compliment to our Creator to walk in the ways, to walk and emulate our Creator. That's all I'm here to remind you to do. That's all you're doing. Don't emulate me. Emulate the Creator. Emulate, don't emulate, hire, imitate, imitate and emulate the Creator. You know what I'm saying? We're all here to, you know, remember the ways to imitate the vibration, to emulate, to be the vibration. Not just copy it, to take it for yourself. <laughs> but to be it for the whole, to be it for the whole community. <laughs> Others thought they found evidence. Oh, let's go back, let's go back. Where we at? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So although, as we shall see, the early Europeans appreciated the people of the Andes a good deal less than they did the people's engineering those people's engineering accomplishments. Later visitors came to agree that the Spanish historian Jose de Costa, who, after spending many years in Peru, wrote in 1590, surely the Greeks and Romans, if they had known the republics of the Mexicans and the Incas, would have greatly esteemed their laws and governments. The more profound and diligent among the Europeans who have lived in this country, wrote Acosta, have now come to marvel at the order and reason, the order and reason, the order and reason that existed among the native people, the copper color race found here. Order, cleanliness, purity. Order, cleanliness, purity. The life of the mind in the Inca-controlled Andes is beyond the scope or range of this brief survey. But like all the thousands of pre-Columbian cultures in the Americas, it was deeply embedded both in the wonders and the cyclical rhythms of the surrounding natural world and the cultural affections for the unending string of, of genealogical forebears and descendants who had lived and who would live and indefinitely on indefinitely or so it was thought in these marvelous mountains and valleys and plains they thought they would live there indefinitely now you're in cities Negro as one recent analysis of Inca thought and philosophy puts it here's a quote the relationships Andes provide perceived between life and death and between humankind and the natural environment were profoundly different from Spanish and Christian equivalents really Really, the relationships Andeans or South Americans or copper color races perceived between life and death. So the relationship you perceive, Negro, between life and death and between humans 
and the natural environment and your relationship between the natural environment were profoundly, profoundly different from Spanish and Christian equivalents. The land surrounding one told the story of one's first ancestors as much as it told one's own story. The land surrounding one, the land, see your covenants with the Creator and with the Creator comes your land and the land surrounding you told the story of your ancestors as much as it told your own story and the story of those yet to come. It was right that the familiar dead were seen walking through the fields they had once cultivated, thus sharing them with both the living and with the original ancestors who had raised the first crops in the very, in the very same fields. Death was thus the great leveler, not because, as in Christian thought, it reduced all humans to equality in relation to each other and before God. Rather, death was a leveler. Listen up. We're getting the indigenous drop about death. Rather, death was a leveler because by means of its humans were reintegrated into a network of parents and offsprings that embraced the entire natural order. So it was a leveler because you were connected to your offspring, to your parents, and the offspring connecting to the parents. Oh, wow, the entire connection, like you were back connected, that embraced the entire natural order. It wasn't a separation or, hey, we're all the same now that we're dead. Nah, <laughs> you're back in the crystal, the order that you were created in. We were not all created in the same crystallized process, the same crystallization. To the east of the Inca homeland, down from the majestic peaks of the Andes are the dense jungles of the Amazon, followed by the Brazilian highlands. And we just got some drop, check out that last drop, linking the Brazilian gold to Solomon's gold. They're linking the Brazilian gold to Solomon's gold, the gold of the Andes, with Solomon's treasure, Solomon's gold. We know Khalifa's here, which means Sheba's here. And if Sheba's here, Solomon's here. And Solomon's gold is linking with South America. We're talking about the Andes. Who is Preston John? Who is this David, the line of David? Who's the priest king? We coming. We on your ass, Preston John. We been on your ass, Preston John. Man, when we find Preston John, it's game over. Preston John reintroduces himself. Allow me to reintroduce myself. I'm King David again. Found the youth is here. It's all in play. And that's really what the drop is, that these are not myths. So this was your natural order to the east of the Inca homeland, down the majestic peaks of the Andes, or the dense jungles of the Amazon, followed by the Brazilian highlands, and then the Pampas of present-day Argentina together. Well over 4 million square miles of earth, an area larger than that of the United States today. Within this land, the largest rivers rushes through the world's greatest forests. And within the forest live people so numerous and so exotic in the first, to the first Western visitors that the Europeans seemed unable to decide whether they had stumbled onto the legendary terrestrial paradise. Quick, man. I'm done. Done, man. For what? For what? Why? Why? Why keep reading? <laughs> Why keep reading? For you to say, hey, yeah, terrestrial paradise. These are their records, man. This is getting, they're bringing them out of these logs, just like the Biblioteca de Colombia and Sevilla, Spain is coming out of the Spanish logs. These are the conquistadors. You're hearing it from Hijack 101. I told y'all they said the Orinoco River, Columbus said the Orinoco River flowing out of South America connected to Mount Roraima, which was flowing out of the terrestrial paradise in South America. And that's a tree in Mount Roraima, the tree, tree Roraima in South America is the source of the Amazon and the Orinoco River. And Columbus said the Orinoco River is flowing out of terrestrial paradise and he's coming from that world to this old world here. This is the old world, people. Copper color race, stand up, because they found you here in terrestrial paradise. I mean, 
you gotta dig on it. Why well, keep reading? What? What? That's all you need to know. Nah, read more. All right, man, I'm gonna read more. After this, I'm gonna throw this book. You ain't gonna, I'm gonna throw this book. Wow! They found us here. Wow! They found us here. Wow! To the east of the Inca homeland, down the majestic peaks of the Andes, are the dense jungles of the Amazon. What did Horace Butler say? What did we get last time? That the migration happened through the Mexica Yucatan. I mean, did it happen leaving the four corners through the Yucatan into South America, like Horace Butler said? With Moab and Edom right there in South America, like Horace Butler saying, and that the, what's that, the, um, uh, man, what's that river? The, the Jordan River is the Atlantic. Let's go. Followed by the Brazilian highlands and then the pompous of the present day Argentina. Western visitors, the first Western visitors, that the European the Europeans seemed unable to decide whether they had stumbled onto the legendary terrestrial paradise of legends. Remember, they were getting your writings, right? They were getting writings about you here. They just found you here, though. So up until what the fort, whatever you want to call it. You were just a myth. That's why everything is mythos to these people. That's why all these Greek mythos of all their stuff, their pantheons are all really based on the writings <laughs> that they're getting out of this Atlantis here. Lemuria that connects here to India. These are the Indies. There's more land that you don't see than there is land that you do see. And that should humble you. And me. <laughs> so... They didn't know if they stumbled on a legendary terrestrial paradise or an evil confederacy of demons, <laughs> or maybe both. All right. Meanwhile, they're leaving the Black Plague, and they're eating you. They're chopping you up, saying convert or die, and they're saying maybe we stumbled on demons. Sounds like something a demon would say. Disappointed that there were no great cities in this boundless part of the New World, the earliest travelers let their imaginations run riot. There was evidence some of them claimed that the Apostle St. Thomas had visited Brazil. So they're looking for the great cities in Brazil. They're looking for all that treasure. Great city means cities of gold. So they're looking for it. So if they're disappointed, it doesn't mean it's not there. It means that they couldn't find it. They couldn't touch the frequency. And if all this gold hasn't been touched and it's been led, left to the descendants, even to ask Aztec gold, ask those so-called natives, they say, nah, we can't even touch it. It's left to the Aztec descendants. And who are they but the people that don't know who they are today? Hmm. Gold is waiting for somebody. And only one group of people truly don't know who the fuck they are. Gold is found here waiting for somebody. And the one group of people that's from here think they're from Africa. Damn, that's a cold twist, ain't it? I mean, that's an Iverson crossover. If I ever seen one, how do you get the gold? How do you get the birthrights? You tell people they're from somewhere else. Oh, because you're melanated. Melanin only comes out of Africa. Have you seen how many lands are there? Again, there's more lands you don't see. So, melon only. That. So, it's no disrespect to any of the fan band. You know what I'm saying? From the beautiful land of earth, wherever you're from. That's a beautiful land, wherever you're from. But we have our lots, and we have our lands, and this is our lot, and we're just waking up to it, and we should feel good, we should feel redeemed. So that's all we're doing. So they don't know if the Apostle St. Thomas had visited Brazil and preached to the natives a millennium and a half ago. If you look carefully enough, it was said you could still see his footprints Impressed into the rock aside, various river banks apparently his preaching was successful since the natives of this region were so generous, kind, so generous and kind, the Jesuit, because <laughs> they were generous, 
they must have got word from this Christian. Or we're we talking about a different Thomas. That has something to do with Prince of John. Let's go, let's go. The Jesuit missionary father Manuel Nobrega reported that there were no people in all the world more disposed to receive the holy faith and the sweet yoke of the evangel, evangel than these. Adding that you can paint on the heart of these people at your pleasure as on a clean sheet of paper. So these people were so open to whatever they say that they saying. Let's take advantage of it because you can paint on the heart of these Negroes at your pleasure. And have they not painted on your heart at their pleasure? They've painted on the heart of the so-called Negro at their pleasure. As on a clean sheet of paper. Others thought they found evidence of somewhat stranger things as one historian surmises or summarizes some of the first European reports. There were men with eight toes, the Matayas, whose feet pointed backwards so that the pursuers tracked them in the wrong direction. Damn! So they're tracking these tracks and it's like, damn, it must be going that way, but their feet pointed backwards. I wasn't there. Both Men, bo men born with white hair that turned black in old age. Wow. <laughs> Others with dogs' heads. Hmm. Starting to sound like what's on the Egyptian wall. And one cyclopean eye. One eye people. All right. Or heads between their shoulders. Or one leg on which they ran very fast. Man, one leg people. So this is where all their myths start coming out of all oh, of America. It's all this anything strange they can conceive in their mind, whatever monstrous situation. And hey, I don't know, I don't know. Then there was Upiera, Upupiera, half man, half fish. Now you heard about these fish gods, right? Even this Isus, a fish god, the product of fish impregnated by the sperm of drowned men. Brazil was also thought to contain giants and pygmies. So we keep hearing about these giants. And of course, Joshua was slaying these giants, these Anakim, these, these sons and daughters of Anak. And of course, there were said to be Amazons from which the great river derived its name. In fact, however, apart from the sheer mystery of this fabulous and seemingly primeval world, perhaps the thing that most amazed and unnerved the Europeans had nothing to do with the fairy tales. It had to do with the fact that this land was covered with innumerable independent tribes and nations of people who seemed inordinately happy and content. Whoa. It ain't got nothing to do with the fairy tale, man. It's the fact that they found you happy, man. It ain't got nothing to do with the fairy tale, man. It's the fact that they found you content, man. Your contentness is what messes them up. They're hijacked by your happiness. So they put you in misery, in a frequency of misery. It had to do with the fact that this land was covered with innumerable independent tribes. Innumerable independent tribes. And nations of people who seem inordinately happy and content and whose, whose lives live of apparent total liberty, freedom, sovereignty. That was their status. They had neither kings nor princes. Wrote the Calvinist missionary Juan de Leri in 1550. And consequently each is more or less as much a lord as the other. The creator. <laughs> the creator was their everything. Or returning. As a dom, you know what I'm saying, to, to where the creator is our everything. The creator is our everything. Many of the people of this vast region, including some linguistically distinct cultures of the Tupian and Caraban and Jivarion, Jivaroan and Nambi, Quarian and Arakan and Tukanoan and Makuan, the Topi Gorani, and others lived in cedar planked houses. Imagine having some cedar planks. 
Love to a uh, Paco, man. I mean, I just put some cedar, man. Rub some cedar on my hands, man. How you like it, man? Feel good. I put some on my temple, man. I got some cedar happening. Rub it in my hair, man. Ah! <laughs> I'm about to just, you know, start picking up shit. I feel good. Let's go. Man, y'all gotta, yeah, y'all gotta get the drop of Paco, man, on that cedar, man. That's all I gotta tell you. That's all I gotta tell you. All right. All right. Alright, so I'm going to skip ahead a little bit, because I want to get to this pestilence, man. Get this one page. Alright, so I'm going to get to this chapter called Pestilence and Genocide. Now, I covered this before, I want to get some fresh eyes on it. And let's get to this one page, Native. let's get this paragraph. In 40,000 years, hundreds of millions of America's native people, copper color races, have built their homes and their societies on a land mass equal to one fourth of the Earth's ground surface. Stop. <laughs> have built their homes on a land mass equal to one fourth of their known Earth's surface. So imagine the known land that you know that. You're indigenous to a fourth of it. And in this fourth, it's neither too hot nor too cold. And they're finding all this gold. And they're calling it new, but it's old. So we're now told. <laughs> all right, man, the game's to be told, not sold, man. So they're finding you in the perfect climate, surrounded by gold, and you still don't know who you are. So-called Negro. Even in that letter from Hitler, it said that these Negroes were the jewelry, the jewelry, the jewelry. And that man, this corporation, is really stepping on some toes by enslaving the people of the Creator. Some people were smarter than that. Consistent with the great diversity of their natural environment, some of these original inhabitants of the Western Hemisphere lived in relatively small communities that touched only lightly on the land while others resided in cities that were among the largest and most sophisticated to be found anywhere in the world. Now, let's go to their world. Let's go to their world. This is not the new world. Get out the mind of a hijack. But let's go to their world. And it's all about pestilence and genocide. Let's get a little bit of it. Now that Spain that Christopher Columbus and his crews left behind just before the dawn of August 3rd, 1492, as they sailed forth from Palos and out into the Atlantic, was for the most of its people a land of violence, squalor, treachery, intolerance. In this respect, Spain was no different from the rest of Europe. Epidemic outbreaks of plague and smallpox, along with routine attacks of measles, influenza, diphtheria, typhus, typhoid fever, fever, and more frequently swept European cities and towns clean of 10 to 20 percent of their populations at a single stroke. 20 percent gone. 20 percent gone. 20 percent gone. This was the world Columbus was leaving behind because he came to find new life he was playing for keeps they love Columbus is Cristobal the Christ bearer because they they worship the man that gave him life he did deals with people that look like you to get more life for all of them because it wasn't just white people suffering in Europe these were melanated people suffering in Europe melanated tribes and these melanated tribes made treaties with these melanated tribes here to enslave you and use other people as middlemen as managers on your plantation so you're like the white man man that man's been used as a manager and the people that manage him look like you until they too were put in captivity, some of them, and some of them are still behind the scenes pulling the strings. And that's the drop. Some are walking among you right now looking like you 
and got all the drop on this kingdom. I mean, behind the scenes, who knows what what looks like, but we know what the proxy looks like. We know what the face of tyranny and chaos looks like. We know what the face that they've given us looks like. And now we got to step back and say, man, all this shit, let me get past this what you look like shit. What tribe are you? Because these tribes made deals with these tribes and some tribes created other tribes and made treaties with them to conquer who? The most high seed, the seed of Jacob, the seed of Hawakol. Let's get this pestilence, man. 20% gone. 20% gone. As late as the mid-17th century, we're talking 1600s, more than 80,000 Londoners, people in London, one out of every six residents in the city died from plague in a matter of months. One out of six, man. 20% gone. 15%, 10% gone. One out of every six residents in the city died from plague in a matter of months. And again and again, as with its companion diseases, the pestilence they called the Black Death return, like most of the other urban centers in Europe, says one historian who has specialized in the subject. Every 25 or 30 years, listen up, every 25 or 30 years, sometimes more frequently, the city was convulsed by a great epidemic. So they got hit with plagues every 25 to 30 years. 20% gone. 20% gone. 20% gone. They got hit with plagues every 20, every 25 years or so. One out of six people. That's the plague. I mean, that's what they were dealing with. Now they came over and saw you frolicking surrounded by gold. Now do you see the bitterness these people have that they have to take it all from you because they can't return to where they came from? They know what lies for them there. They keep flocking here, right? And you keep being told you're not from here, right? See? No, go over there. You're from Africa. We need to keep coming here because we don't we, we don't want no more 20% gone. 20% gone. 20% gone. And it wasn't just white people suffering. These were the tribes before that rolled on you, before dealing with the plagues from rolling on you, before still catching up with them. Every 25 or 30 years, sometimes more frequently, the city was convulsed by a great epidemic. Indeed, for centuries in the individual's life, chances in Europe's pest house cities were so poor that the natural populations of the towns were in perpetual decline. That was offset only by in Migration from the countryside in migration, says one historian, that was vital if the cities were to be preserved from extinction. Extinction, man. Famine, too, was common. What J.H. Eliot has said of 16th century Spain had held true throughout the continent for generations beyond memory. The rich ate and ate to excess, watched by a thousand Hungry eyes as they consumed their gargantuan meals, the rest of the people starved. This was in normal times. The slightest fluctuation in food prices would cause a sudden death of additional tens of thousands who lived in the, on the margins of perpetual hunger. So precarious was the existence of these multitudes in France that as late as the 17th century, 1600s, each average increase in the price of wheat or millet directly killed a proportion of French population equal to nearly twice the percentage of Americans who died in the Civil War. And these dead bodies would just be in the street. That was the 17th century when times were getting better. In the 15th century and 16th century, prices fluctuated constantly, leading people to complain as a Spanish agriculturalist did in 1513 that today, a pound of mutton costs as much as a whole sheep used to, as loaves, a loaf as much as a fanega, a brushel and a half of wheat, a pound of wax or oil as much as a, a roll by 25 Spanish pounds. But since both 
causes of death, disease, and famine were so common throughout Europe, many surviving records did not bother or were not able to make distinctions between them. Consequently, even today, historians find it difficult or impossible to distinguish between those of the citizen, cit citizenry who died of disease and those who merely star starved to death. So they don't know how many of these citizens died of disease or starvation, but this is how they was rocking there. And they came over here starving, which is why they dug up your corpses and ate them in their own records. Which is why they couldn't plant food. They didn't know anything about planting food because they're coming from disease and starvation. Only a hijack 101 is coming from such a place. And when the Mosai says in your script, man, I'm going to send the worst of the heathen. I'll send the worst of the heathen constantly, constantly. The worst of the heathens going to round you up. They have to be coming from an area of disease and pestilence, right? Any parasite, that's going to be their order. Chaos is their order. They come from chaos and create chaos and never stop creating chaos. Invasions, chaos. This invasion, chaos. Invasions never cease. They continue to spread the disease, dis-ease for everything natural. All right, man, I want to jump ahead. Get on this Tupac. We're going to get to some of this Tupac pretty soon, man. Yeah, man, I know, I know Tupac got a movie coming out. <laughs> We're going to get to it. Man. Roadside ditches filled with stagnant water. Not moving water. Stagnant water served as public latrines in the cities of the 15th century. And they would continue to do so for centuries to follow up. So too with other nauseous habits, poisonous habits, and public health hazards of the time persist on into the future from the practice of leaving the de decomposing awful, awful the bodies of butchered animals to fester in the streets. This is what I'm saying. This created more disease, leaving decomposing animals in the streets in London. All right. Special problem, as historian Lawrence Stone puts it, of poor hole, poor holes, pores holes. These were large, deep, open pits in which they laid the bodies of the poor, side by side, row upon row. Only when the pit was filled with bodies was it finally covered with the whole earth. So it laid open until it was completely filled. It laid open with all that disease and decomposing bodies on top of bodies, rows of bodies until it was completely filled and by that time the disease was out of control right one contemporary quoted by stone delicate delicately observed how noisome how noisome how horrible the stench is that arises from these holes so stowed with dead bodies especially in sultry seasons and after rain after the rain, ah, oh, the stench. And this is how it was rocking. The wealthy had their problems too. They hungered after gold. All right, I'm skipping ahead to page 61. If you got the book, let's go. The wealthy had their problems too. They hungered after the gold and silver. The crusades begun four centuries earlier and had increased the appetites of affluent Europeans for exotic foreign luxuries, for silks and spices, fine cottons, drugs, perfume, jewelry, Material pleasures that required pay and bullion. Thus gold had become for Europeans, in the words for Venetian com commentator of the time, the sinews of all government. Gold became the spirit of the government. They worshipped the spirit of this gold. They worshipped the spirit, the energy of it. They worshipped the gold. Along with worshiping the sun, they worship the gold because the gold is a product of the sun. Same property, right? So they worship the same energy. They used it to get the sun's energy, right? So they got the energy from it and they worshiped it. And they built their, you know, idols, you know, all that. You already know, you already know that story. So this gold became the spirit of all government. Its mind, soul, its essence, and its very life. The supply of the precious metal by way of the Middle East 
by way of the Middle East and Africa has always been uncertain. Now, however, the wars in Eastern Europe had nearly emptied the continent's coffers, coffers, a new supply, a more regular supply, and preferably a cheaper supply was needed. Then it goes into, you know, the violence that ensued and came out of that. You know what I mean? On the very day that Columbus finally set forth on his journey that would shake the world, the part of the city he sailed from was filled with ships that were deporting Jews from Spain. Now, were these Israelites from Spain? If they're being deported right after this dumb diverses papal bull 1452 saying subjugate all of these so-called pagans and enemies of Christ. And they rounded up all these Israelites everywhere and went to war against the Israelites right here in America. That's why 1492 follows the 1452 papal bull, the document that let them put you in subject, subject, perpetual, perpetual subjugation perpetual subjugation you are a subject forever according to this document the papal bull dom diverses 1452 and that's the real spill and that is your situation today that is all of your situation today you're at war you've been invaded that's the truth what do you do now ignore it or do you remember Ask the right questions. You have every right to be who you are. You have every right to be who you are. Even if it makes people uncomfortable that you are who you are. Even if it shakes shit up that you are who you are. We'll never stop growing. We'll never stop returning. That's a natural thing for this frequency. So me, you, we got no choice but to be who we are naturally. We can't pretend to be something else. There's only so long you can do that. It's only so long, so-called Negro, you could pretend to tap dance and do other things for somebody else before you stop and say, you know what I'm saying? Where, where's my land? Where's, where is my goal? You know what I'm saying? Where, where are all the things that you've taken? Again, you can't take my granddad's wallet, pass it down five, six, seven generations in your family, and just because you didn't tell them that yo daddy stole it, they think it's yours. Does it make that wallet yours or is it still my granddaddy wallet? It's still his wallet, right? Even if they're in the impression that they can take your title, it's still your title, it's still your land. Copper color race value here. Let's get this last part, man. Let's go, let's go, let's go. So by the time the expulsion complete between, by the time the expulsion, we're talking about the Jews in Spain or Israelites in Spain, I said 120,000 to 150,000 Jews or Israelites have been driven from their homes. Their value, have been driven from their homes, their valuables, often meager, having been first confiscated and then were cast out to sea as one contemporary described the scene. So here's a description of the scene of what was happening following this dumb diverses papal bull 1452. It was pitiful to see their sufferings. Many were consumed by hunger, especially nursing mothers and their babies. Half dead mothers held dying children in their arms. I can hardly say how cruelly and greedily they were treated by those who transported them. Many were drowned by the avarice of the sailors and those who were unable to pay their passage sold their children. This was the world of an ex trader of African slaves named Christopher Columbus, African slave, and his shipmates left behind as they sailed from the city of Palos in August 1492. And it was a world racked by disease, disease that killed in massive numbers, never 20%. But importantly, that also tended to immunize survivors, a world in which all but the wealthy often could not feed themselves and in which the wealthy themselves hungered after gold 
It was a world as well of cruel violence and certainly of holy truth. Little wonder then that the first report back from the Atlantic voyage purportedly to the Orient caused such sensations across the length and breadth of Europe. In the letter composed aboard the Nina, as the returned ships passed through the Azores, Columbus described his discovery. Listen up, Negro! Columbus described his discovery during the previous fall and winter of what he thought was the Indian Sea and its many islands filled with people without number. One of the first major islands which he called Wana or Wana or Hawana, known today as Cuba, was originally Wana. Now you got Havana, but that V is a W, so it's Hawana. Havana, Cuba is Hawana, Cuba. And Columbus went to Cuba looking for the Grand Khan. He brought a Hebrew interpreter there to speak with the Grand Khan, looking for the Grand Khan or the Israelite king in Hawana. Let's go. One of the first major islands, which he called Hawana, known as Cuba, was so long, was so long that I thought it must be the mainland, the province of Cathay. They thought Cuba is Cathay. Katniss, Cathay, Cuba, let go. Another large island, the one we now know as Hispaniola. So Cathay is Haiti, is Cathay, let's go. Another large island, the one we now know as Hispaniola, containing the nations of Haiti and the Dominican Republic, he called La Española. Columbus had reason to be impressed with the size of these two islands, since together they were two-thirds as large as his home country of Italy. The Admiral continued his description of the wonders he had seen in a passage that must be quoted at length if we are to achieve even a small understanding of the impact his voyage almost immediately had on the people of Europe living under the wretched conditions of their time, pestilence, plague, and just coming out of another cold and miserable winter. So I want you to listen closely to what was described about you when you were found here. And you tell me if it's something worth remembering or forgetting. Let's go. As Hawana. So all the other islands are very fertile to the excessive degree, excessively fertile. And this one, especially in Hawana. In it, there are many harbors on the sea coast beyond comparison with others which I know in Christendom. And numerous rivers, good and large, which is marvelous. Its lands are lofty, and in it there are many sierras and very high mountains, so to which the island Tenerife is not comparable. All are most beautiful of a thousand shapes, all accessible and filled with trees of a thousand kinds and tall and they seem to touch the sky, for I am told that they never lose their foliage, which I can believe, for I saw them as green and beautiful as they are in Spain in May, and some of them are flowering, some with fruit, and there are were singing, and they were singing the nightingale and other little birds of a thousand kinds in the north of November, there where, where I went. There are palm trees of six or eight kinds, which are a wonder to behold because of their beauty, beautiful variety. And so are the other trees and fruits and plants. Therein are marvelous pine groves, pine, cedar, an extensive meadow country. And there is honey and there are many kinds of birds and great variety of fruits up country. There are many mines of meadows, so-called Negro, and population is innumerable, so-called Negro, La Spanola, Hawana, they're calling Cathay, is marvelous. The Sierras and the mountains and the plains and the meadows and the lands are so beautiful and rich for planting and sowing and for livestock of every sort and for building towns and villages, the harbors of the sea. Here are such as you could not believe it without seeing them, and so the rivers, many and great, 
and good streams, the most of which bear gold. Most of your rivers and your streams carried gold. Now, if it sounds like paradise, Negro, that was no accident, Negro. Paradise filled with gold. And when he came to describe the people he had met, Columbus, Edenic imaginary, never faulted his Edenic imaginary imagination. His Eden, his Eden imagination never faulted. Let's go. The people of this island, Negroes, the people of this island, copper color race, Negroes, and all the other islands which I have found and seen or have not seen, all go naked men and women and their mothers bore them as their mothers bore them so he's describing this adamic edenic scene of frolicking around his free free-minded as their mothers bore them except that some women cover one place only with the leaf of a plant or with the net of cotton which they make for that purpose they have no iron or steel or weapons nor are they capable of using them although they are well-built people of handsome stature because they are wondrously timid. All right, so this timid scene. So you can get the Eden drop, but you also know that he's painting a picture for those that also want to conquer you easily. So to say that you're going around naked and you don't know how to use any type of metals or anything like that is to say, oh, man, these people are timid and easy to conquer and, and they're rich as a mug. They're draped out with gold. They're, they're rich, but they're timid and they don't even know how to use weapons. Now, either he rolled up on the area like that, or he, you know, is painting a certain picture. So, even in that, we got to dodge that hijack because he knows who's reading it, and he's trying to get more money from this queen, from this crown, for more, you know what I'm saying, for more drama, for more drama. So, check it out. So, they are so artless and free with all they possess that no one would believe it without seeing it. Of anything they have, if you ask them for it, they never say no. And of course, they took advantage of that, right? Rather, they invite the person to share it and show as much love as if they were giving their hearts. And whether the thing be of value or of a small price, at once they are content with whatever little thing, whatever kind, may be given to them. They were content. They were, you know what I'm saying, steamed. They were... They were upset at your contentness. They were bitter and butthurt at your contentness, at your weather, at your goal, that the Creator loved you. He loved you even in that time, even in when you're getting jammed up and, and, and you're in hijack mode, you still were found in paradise, man. You were still found in paradise after all that. You were still found in paradise. How much love do you know the Creator must have for you? If even at your... Even at that point that you had to go through this substance, this pressuring, this purifying, you were still found in paradise, Negro. And it only turned to shit recently. Buildings and concrete buildings and, and no gold, no trees, just buildings and, and, and highways and concrete. Right? For years to come, Columbus repeatedly would insist that his expeditions and adventures in the New World had nothing to do with mere reason, mathematics, and maps, as two scholars of the subject put it, but rather his execution of the fear of the Indies was the fulfillment of prophecies in Isaiah. Read it. Pause it. All right. This is page 63. So Columbus, just like the Book of Prophecy, Book of Prophecies, De la Perfrecias in the Biblioteca de la Colombina. Just like the same thing we're getting. His execution of the affair of the Indies, Columbus. Like he said, I'm coming to America to conquer the Holy City of Mount Zion. I'm coming to America to conquer the Holy City of Mount Zion. His execution of the affairs of the Indies was a fulfillment of prophecies in Isaiah. And his hijacked mind as a millenarium, thinking that the world is ending in 1666, escaping the Black Plague and pestilence and death. He's fulfilling some prophecy stuff. He's going to conquer this because he thinks he's a prophet. That's what's being taught to him. Well, hey, they're all taught 
this type of, you know, wicked scheme, this type of wicked thing to say that your laws are gone, you are gone as a people, you, who cares about your land rights, who cares about your claim, it's all the same for everyone, everyone gets to share in the natural root, in the natural branches, and I ask you, is it true to be lawless and share with the natural root and natural branches? In addition to helping explain, if taken serious, why Columbus in many respects was a less successful navigator and helmsman than is commonly supposed, one into the Caribbean he rarely seemed to know where he was or he knew he was going to the Indias and routinely lost ships that were under his command. This rhetorical claim of biblical guidance is a glue to understanding the European reaction to his reported finds. Alright, alright. All right. All right. So you remember, man, we're in this Jack Forrest book. Man, we about to get the dismount, man. But I just want to get this uh, couple things, man, with this intro. This chapter's called Africans in America, right? Continental contacts across the Atlantic to 1500. Get up, let me get all up in your earpiece with this one, man. Then I'm going to go to sleep. All right. It is well known that the Atlantic Ocean contains a series of powerful rivers or currents that can facilitate the movement of floating objects from the Americas to Europe and Africa, as well as from the latter to the Americas. We're talking about the Gulf Stream. We're going to talk about that it's four times easier to go from here to Africa than it is to go from Africa to here because you can flow with the Gulf Stream. There's debris that reach Africa effortlessly it's just floating up the Gulf Stream but you have to work your ass off to manage those currents to come back here so that lets you know if it's four times harder to reach you so-called Negro that means you must have had to drop on navigation if it's easy for you to drift up that way and then if you have the mastery you know how to navigate your way back easily but that's a mastery those are the seafaring you know what I'm saying masters of the sea you know what I mean but, let's get the drop. So in the North Atlantic, the most prominent current is that of the Gulf Stream, which swings through the Caribbean and then moves into the northeasterly direction from Florida to the Great Banks off Terra Nova, Newfoundland, turning then eastwards towards the British Isles in the Bay of Biscay. This current has carried debris from Jamaica and the Caribbean to the Hebrides, the Hebrides, and the Orneys, Orkneys of Scotland. So from Jamaica to Scotland, it's carried, the Gulf Stream has carried debris from Jamaica all the way up to Europe. Moreover, John Marion tells us that the valuable hardwood was commonly washed ashore along the coast of Ireland and Wales. This, this timber from the ocean, borne by the Gulf Stream, really came from the rivers of Mexico. So again, you don't even have to paddle a boat to get from Mexico to Europe or Africa. You can just ride the Gulf Stream. It's like, a, you know, just ride the wave. So who discovered who first? And if the Most High has you protected, Negro, does that not reveal the love of the Most High to have you protected in this manner that it's four times harder to find you than it is for you to find the hijack? But you came from there, right? But it's harder to find you here. So the Most High has you in a place that's four times harder to get to, surrounded by gold, cities of gold, perfect weather, and your commandments are written in Paleo-Hebrew right here, right here in New Mexico, New Mexico, or you, dog. Right there in Udall are your commandments. Let's go. This timber from the ocean born by the Gulf Stream really came from the rivers of Mexico. 
marrying a student of transatlantic navigation by small vessels. So this person is a student of crossing the Atlantic, a student of navigation by small vessels. Also states that the first attempt, the first success of crossing the Atlantic, listen up, so-called Negro. The first attempt, the first success of crossing the Atlantic by one man could only come from the American side. Pause it. Getting too excited sometimes, you know, but it is what it is. Read that right there, all right? Pause it, read it. Pause it, read it. Let's go. A couple more minutes. So the first attempt, the first success of crossing the Atlantic by one man could only come from the American side because the crossing is much less difficult in that direction. A French writer has said justly in all probability that if America had been the old world, its inhabitants would have discovered Europe long before we did, in fact, discover America. If a, a French writer has justly has said that if America was the old world, which it, I just told you it is, and there, this writer here in the 1500s is substantiating the same thing. A French writer has said that if America has been the old world, its inhabitants, you Negroes, would have discovered them in Europe long before they discovered you Negroes. In fact, this is because of the prevailing winds from the West as well as the currents one can says Marion sail in a straight line from Boston via Newfoundland to Ireland or Cornwall with almost the certainty of fair winds. The other direction, listen up, the other direction coming from Europe or Africa requires twice the distance, three times the time, and four times the sweat. So it's four times harder to find you than it is for you to find them. So if America is the old world, which it is, its inhabitants would have long discovered Europe <laughs> before they discovered you. Long discovered so-called Africa before they discovered you. You're in the old world and it requires, what? Twice the distance to come find you. Three times the sweat. Three times the time to find you. And four times the sweat. So let me tell you, man, if they got you from Africa, does it really make feasible sense? Does it really make economic sense to travel in a direction with all these millions of slaves twice? Hold up. Twice the distance. So would it make sense for them to take you there, here, traveling twice the distance, three times the time, and with four times the effort? or for them to find you here, so-called Negro, and float your ass up the Gulf Stream. Nice and easy. I told you we're gonna get in this Tupac, man. <laughs> Tupac, man, we're gonna, two minutes, this is our dismount, we're gonna talk about this Brazilian. We talk Brazil, we talk Solomon, let's go. Brazilian African context and the continued enslavement of the Americas. The most important source of the continuous contact would appear, however, to be between Brazil and West Africa, and especially with Angola, as noted earlier, from the 1630s onward, there was continuous contact between Brazil and West Africa, and Brazil's population included many Americans and part Americans. Many white Brazilians were actually half American, Negro, and the four and the free non-slave population, as well as their slaves, included large increments of American ancestry. American ancestry. Now, I'm going to skip to this page. It says, after the abortive Tupac Amaru rebellion in Peru in 1781. So, Tupac Amaru rebelled in Peru.